All right, we are back uh, for part two, or I guess what we can more uh, accurately describe this as negating uh, criminal justice reform in the resolution. And I guess uh, one asterisk, excuse me as I get my little rolly chair situated here, one asterisk uh, that I would put there is, um, yeah, my camp lab. I don't know if y'all know this in a previous video, but I was trying to track them in the camp tournament. Uh, out of the 48 possible ballots, we got 30. 35 of them, yeah. And I think a few of those 13 were against each other, so I'll take it as a lab leader. Uh, shout out to Woodle and the abolitionists in my lab. Also shout out to my partner, uh, Maggie Ryan. Um, but I think that uh, it's important that we talk about how to negate the topic. Uh, and I must say that I approach that as a uh, preferred to win. You know, I was a two in, you know, in my career, my heyday, you know, when I was, you know, at my best, I thought, which you know, probably wasn't the best debater, but I think I'm a fairly decent judge, good coach. Um, and so I think it's important that we talk about how to negate the resolution. And so with that, uh, we're just going to share the screen and boom, here we go. Once again, negating CJR, like I said. Uh, and in the first, just like in the first video, this one will be available to you all as well. Um, uh, excuse me, the presentation. And so like I alluded to earlier, you know, the... Uh, the uh, top wording committee threw you a bone if you are, you know, if you read TUSFG, you know, that word enact is a very dicey word in terms of forcing governmental action, but not only just action, uh, legislation, and why uniquely legislation is what enactment means. And there's some debate to be, there's a debate to be had there about like, you know, courts can enact change, and so reform could be changed, so enactment of change could be the courts, and therefore you meet under that interpretation. Uh, but you know, uh, it just implies policy more strongly than I think past resolutions. You know, uh, in prior years, the wording committee will put the word policy in the topic. And I think, uh, I forget when they stopped, but there was actually a time when we stopped seeing the word policy in the topic in the, or in the, resolu the wording of the resolution. And so now seeing an act is kind of like a swing that direction of that type of wording of the topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think negatives, you know, critical negatives can start with the word criminal or not even just the word itself, but what the idea of that word is and what the criminalization looks like and what does criminalization need, lead to or, excuse me, what does it uh, feed or influence, right? So uh, anti-blackness uh, teams or Afro-pessimist teams can make those types of arguments in terms of uh, that. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but these are the, the types of things that we're looking at. Uh, what is a criminal? Um, <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, let me, I should have silenced my cell phone. I thought I did. Uh, and so uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this topic is insanely large. And uh, it's essentially three topics about criminal justice. Essentially, uh, It's essentially three topics about the criminal justice system and reforming it all smashed into one. And so you have to think about just like, where does that put you as a negative? And so just first of all, I think that helps with some of your T arguments, right? Not necessarily, you know, TUSFG, but like if you read T policing, T enact, whatever the case may be, T criminal justice reform as a term of art, I think that there are some arguments to be made about uniquely why this year over limiting might be better on a topic so large and so massive that it's already difficult enough to get traction as a negative team. So maybe we should over limit and err on over limiting to create depth in a debate instead of under limiting and creating a world where it's like the wild wild west you know and metaphorically you know teams can just read whatever they want you know <clears throat> that there has to be some type of check excuse me on the topic so i think that's a good place for you to st for negative teams to start uh and so i think that uh to counterbalance all the different types of solvency mechanisms and things like that i think it's important for negatives to have some just generic solvency answers i think just a toolkit for lack of a better term that i would call it is what you will really need this year. And that was one thing that I pressed my lab on when we first started our three weeks together at camp is we need to have, in, in, in addition to all the other arguments that we cut, which were beautiful, by the way, I told them we needed to have a generic, just like, for lack of a better term, we called it police in the police file. And, you know, it, there were, it wasn't all about the policing portion of the topic, but that's just what we called it. And it was essentially a circumvention, solvency, answer, toolkit, everything that you need to approach the topic as a negative. And so we're going to approach how to, we're going to talk about how to approach those. So if you are hitting someone from my abolitionist lab, I'm telling you they're ahead of you, they're ahead on you on this debate. 
uh, but more offensive approach can be taken in these types of uh, instances, right? That there are examples of instances of, oh, excuse me, there are instances of enactment of criminal justice reform that was in a way an attempt to rectify disparities and in turn created more disparities for minorities, especially black and brown people. And so uh, some disparities that could include, but are not limited to crack versus cocaine laws. I have never understood. Now, mind you, I'm not a drug dealer. I don't cook cocaine. I don't cook crack, none of that. In fact, drugs had destroyed my family for a long time. But I will say this, that having seen enough documentaries to know that it takes about you know, you can take out, you can take whatever amount you want of cocaine, do something with some baking soda, and then come together and you got crack. So you would think that you would punish the cocaine more because a lot of cocaine can create even more crack. But instead, we punish the crack users more than we do the cocaine users, even though crack is a byproduct of cocaine and not the other way around. But why is that? Just like I said in the first video, the users were black people in the time that cocaine and crack laws, that disparity came about. So when the users were normally people of color, the over uh, policing of those types of uh, drug policies and things like that is what allowed uh, these things to happen. Uh, so you have the 94 crime bill is another good example. Uh, New York and Stop and Frisk and Michael Bloomberg is a great example of instances of like police reform or attempting to like legislate ways to improve policing or do certain things that gets a, that affects uh, minority groups. Uh, there is one thing that um, I have found in my research since I've made this presentation, and that is uh, what's known as a Gideon decision. Uh, and at the time it was reveled or excuse me, celebrated as something that would help uh, minority populations in terms of criminal justice reform. And what we found is that 30, uh, 20, 30 years after the Gideon decision, that Gideon was interpreted in a way uh, that was used against black and brown people. So the same people that the law was meant to, su to support or protect or uh, make their lives better, in fact, was interpreted in a way to make their lives net worse, right? So there are a lot of arguments to be made about why uniquely criminal justice reform can actually have a counter, you know, a counter-effective approach, you know, a counter-effective impact, I guess you would say, for lack of a better term. And so those are ways that you can get traction here. So I just think you need a circumvention toolkit, excuse me, and I, circumvention is your best friend. Fiat, and this is where these debates upset me on the high school level. Well, we fiat. Fiat doesn't get you out of circumvention. Fiat, guarantee, fiat ensures implementation, excuse me, fiat ensures enactment, not implementation. Right, I want to say that again. Fiat ensures enactment, but not implementation. That is part of your solvency story, I think. And that is a good place for negative teams to make that distinction and ask to just read generic solvency arguments. It, this is the wrong topic for generic solvency. I'm sorry, it, 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 especially when you read the, the paper. And a lot of the paper speaks to the arguments about like process counter plans and picks. And we'll get to that about why specifically on this year, there probably should be less theoretical objections possibly to those types of arguments because they are legitimately grounded in literature. Okay. And about what the checks on those type of process counter plans look like. But for right now on circumvention, right? So there are just a few avenues generically on circumvention that you can talk about. And right now, one of the best ones is AG Bill Barr. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Debate, you know, the world always gives us something in terms of like unique arguments to make in the context of debate rounds. And I think A.G. Bill Barr is important here. Because in 1992, in the midst of the crime bill, when the crime bill was being debated and they were discussing like what should be included, even then, even with the incarceration rates as high as they were in the early 90s, he still, he still was advocating that we were under incarcerating people and arguing that the that the reforms that they were putting into place to be tough on crime were not tough enough on crime. So this man is now AG again. And let's not forget that he became AG at the end of the Iran-Contra scandal. It was his idea to pardon everybody involved in the Iran-Contra scandal, including uh, Ollie North, I think uh, is his name, Oliver North, right? So, I, so there are a lot of arguments to be made about why Bill Barr is anti-criminal justice reform. Additionally, the Department of Justice has a unique vested interest to not enforce reforms. If I told you, excuse me, if I told you 
that we should have the top defense attorney in the country set laws about reform, what should and should not be policed, what should and should not be criminalized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You would look at me and say, well, Colton, that's cool and all, but like, that's probably not best for, uh, you know, the world. And I'd say maybe we probably may under prosecute some things. I could grab that out. That's cool. But do we really want on the opposite hand, which we have, the top prosecutor being able to decide and dictate and advocate for policies and changes to the system that makes it easier for them to criminalize acts and makes it easier for them to prosecute acts, right? That is a very daunting question that we've never really asked ourselves in, in terms of a country is, should our top prosecutor be the gatekeeper in terms of what is and what is not criminalized? Right. And also, because the Department of Justice has a vested interest, they will not enforce reforms. If the department is made up of career professionals and they say, you know, if I've worked in this department for 10, 15 years and I'm eyeing a big, you know, AG job in a certain district in the eastern district or southern district of a certain state or, you know, whatever uh, federal jurisdiction. And. I've learned the job a certain way for so long. So I really don't have, I've, I've played it this way. So I think under this interpretation, the status quo, any change to the status quo, which makes my job harder or makes it more difficult to prosecute, which is used as a key component in uh, the promotion of uh, attorneys, right? Their prosecution rate, their win rate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera then there is an, in, a built-in incentive into the system to over-incarcerate and over-police and over-prosecute people, right? So because of that built-in inherent system, is reform chain, is real reform possible? Or there is a good story about how the AF gets circumvented, right? Or a lot of times, most incarcerations are at the state, not federal level, right? And I think that people were upset because, well, the federal government shouldn't do things, you know, in, the, in, in criminal justice. And while I think that that's a very, like, mm, whatever argument. I don't even know if that's like legitimate at this point, given everything that the government has done with, with, with respect to the criminal justice system since its inception. I think that there is important argument to be made about the percentages about most incarcerations are at the state, not federal level. So actual federal action may not necessarily decrease the incarceration rate. In the area of forensic science, so we're just going to go, that's just generic circumvention. We just went over, we're going to break it down piece by piece, right? Because you got to have your generic circumvention, your topic area specific circumvention. That way, no matter what the forensic science app is, you they may read, you've never heard. I got my generic forensic science answers. I got my generic police answers, blah, blah, blah. So here on forensic science, there is a large argument to be made that there is a lack of scientific consensus about what is and what is not forensic science. And additionally, about what should and should not be accepted about as, in terms of what is legitimate forensic science, right? Uh, the ability for police departments to use drones and use drone, uh, you know, the capture of drone images to, uh, you know, do investigations and things like that, thermal imaging to look for um, possibly marijuana growth spots and different types of, uh, excuse me, criminal activity. You know, those kinds of things uh, that calls into question. But also the lack of scientific consensus about what is and what isn't um, science, right? Uh, arson investigations we found out over the years were entirely too simplistic. Uh, bite mark analysis used to be the thing, and now it might not be so reliable, right? Maybe the ways in which we understand DNA analysis is also flawed, right? Remember, in the past, the only ways in which we could test for uh, in terms of DNA was blood type. And now it's just if your blood type matched the scene of the crime, then you were convicted. Right, and then about, you know, we, we fast forward to 2020 and about what does DNA analysis look like now, but is that legitimate science, right? There are a lot of people that get on the stand and, 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 and get accepted into the judicial record as experts that may not be actual forensic science experts. Uh, also, just think about the president's Trump's inherent, excuse me, uh, Trump's inherent resistance to all things science, right? His, 
his rollback of EPA protections, his pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, the other things that he has done in terms of the Keystone Pipeline and fracking and oil drilling and things like that. There is a lot of evidence to suggest that he will, oh, duh, his response to coronavirus. All of these are probably good warrants. And also there's a lot of evidence that like his resistance to science writ large has bled into the forensic science uh, sphere. Uh, also, there's been no funding for the National Board since 2017. So, as, and this is why I talked about earlier, apps that don't write specific plan text. If as a negative, this is a year to punish them. Punish them, punish them, punish them. If an app doesn't uniquely include funding, and I ain't saying they gotta say like, where the funding comes from. But if they don't uniquely increase funding for board for a national board or certain types of things in the status quo, that just probably means that they get circumvented because there are no fund structures. And also the app doesn't at least say we'll fund the app through normal means, at least say that. Uh, and there's no way to account for human error, right? If you watch one of the net, if one of the Netflix suggestions I had in the previous video, uh, excuse me, in the prior video, uh, how to fix a drug scandal, Right, there's no way to account for human error and the impact that that has on people. Uh, and also, right, like science, the way that it changes over time, right? It's a uh, science, right? It's constantly evolving. We're learning things that we don't know. We know things that we end up finding out that we didn't know anything about uh, 10, 15 years down the road. So basing someone's life or uh, using that as a metric to establish whether a person is guilty or not, is probably a bad metric and will get circumvented in some way, shape or form. Uh, Policing, okay? Police unions. One of the ar best arguments against uh, against the Policing Act this year are police unions, especially because the federal government does not have the ability to uh, bargain and uh, negotiate with police unions. In fact, um, at the state level, that is a very, uh, at the state level, it's more common, and there are more examples of that actually getting somewhat changed or some type of change or reform. And so I think that federal action, there's an inherent built-in circumvention argument there, is that police unions will just lobby against the app, refuse to interpret it, will, you know, protect the bad apples, and then boom, it's over with. Uh, but you also can't legislate out or change implicit bias as well, right? That there are certain things that just, you know, there are problematic people that do problematic things and problematic jobs, and unfortunately, there are problematic cops and racist cops and and transphobic cops and homophobic cops and ableist cops and I'll agree with you in that attempting to impl in attempting to uh, legislate out those isms probably will not work. It may reinscribe the same problematic or phobic behaviors that those people have in the first place. Structural barriers, right? Uh, a good example of this I'll give. I'm from Arkansas, uh, and I don't want to. I don't want to paint my state in a bad light. I love my state. Uh, I do wish we'd do better sometimes. Uh, and I'm, I've always been an advocate, you know, uh, just I'll just pause for a second. I've always been an advocate that I'm not going to attempt to leave and say, think, you know, I'm going to find better life. I want to make my life better here and make other people's lives better here. And part of the way to start that is forcing people to have these conversations. But to get back to the structural barriers, I think that the uh, a, a, a person that works in a small town here, a small town sheriff here in Arkansas, hypothetically, federal action is not going to make him, not going to make them, excuse me, change. I don't want to uh, exclude anyone out or be uh, problematic here. But I think a, a, a problematic sheriff, they could say, I don't care what the federal government does, you know, Johnny Law ain't going to come down here and tell me what I have to do. And in theory, he's, they're not wrong. Excuse me once again. In theory, they're not wrong. So those structural barriers and the inability to actually force real tangible change, right, is possibly, a, you know, a problem, a, a barrier. A refusal to implement reforms, also an app that doesn't get rid of qualified immunity, bam, boom, qualified immunity is now a circumvention or solvency deficit. Um, sentencing, right, uh, AG Barr will actively resist sentencing measures. We've talked about this before. The first act, the first step act also proves that the app will get narrowly interpreted. This is a good one, folks. Oh, this is beautiful. As a negative, this is gold for you. Because uh, even Sessions started it. But when Barr came in, uh, he from the jump, from the very beginning, almost day one, was like, I don't like this first step act. We're going to narrowly interpret it. And what we found since it was passed, in terms of projections of who we thought it would let out and the number of people that we thought it would let out, it actually let out fewer individuals. 
And so what we see is there is a discrepancy of almost 115 or so ish thousand people that we thought would be let out under the First Step Act that weren't let out under the First Step Act because AG Barr and the Department of Justice narrowly interpreted the guidelines. And also the ability to lobby against, uh, against certain laws and things like that. I, talk, I alluded to that earlier. Also, some apps will have to concede in cross X, and I think this is good too. Uh, some apps will have to concede whether or not they apply retroactively. And if they do or do not apply retroactively, then I think there are some good arguments to make there, right? If they do apply retroactively, excuse me, then I think that gets you access to, that That should operate as a link magnifier to all of your disadvantages, right? That the mass, like, right, if we are just gonna decriminalize marijuana, cool with the F, but if we're also going to let out everybody that was incarcerated under those laws, that should magnify whatever politics links you're, argu you're articulating, your spending links in terms of getting these people out in terms, right? Because whenever we let someone out, they automatically give them money or at least something, some semblance of money, right? So magnify that times the number of people that they let out. Those can get you, that can get you your types of link arguments. But you're not going to be able to get those unless you isolate that in cross-examination. Uh, and if it's not retroactive, then that's a problem, right? That articulated that as to why that, uniquely positions or posits future suffering as more important than the suffering that it has existed in the status quo and doesn't remedy the constant suffering in the status quo, i.e. the people that are incarcerated that you aren't letting out. Um, yeah, and also just administratively, it might get rolled back. The next president or the next administration, one or two administrations down the line may decide, ah, scrap it, right? So can you actually institute real reform? So case debate, I think there's some, some good arguments to make here, no matter what your debating style is. And of course, you know, I always think that the cruel optimism debate is, is, is perf uh, in, in, the, in these types of debates, because the, the resolution almost begs that the neg make this argument, right? That the putting your faith uh, in these types of changes and such, that inevitably it won't happen. And then those groups that you painted this browsy picture for, or this rosy picture for, will inevitably internalize uh, hatred or disrespect or dislike for themselves, resentment, in the sense that they feel like they, let, they shouldn't have gotten their hopes up and then to get crushed. And then they internalize that and the psychological violence that comes with it. So I think there are a lot of arguments, there's a lot of room to make those arguments. And just generically, because the topic is bi-directional, inherently, uh, there are just some arguments you just need to be ready for as a negative. Just in, in just saying T or read it on the negative probably doesn't solve these this, this, this year. And so when I say your toolkit, circumvention is one part of the toolkit, and that should be a very massive part of your toolkit. But the other, the other massive part of your toolkit should be everything beneath cruel optimism if that's not your jam. If cruel optimism is, is, if cruel optimism is your jam, include that as well. Reform is possible, not possible. And this will, you'll need this in case people read like abolition, and this will just give you just some like, you know, some generic defense traction. Uh, and it may be possible, it may be not possible. You just have that on either side. And there's some evidence to suggest either. Also, I've alluded to this before, that reform will be weaponized and that minorities will either be scapegoated or that the reforms instituted will in fact be used against the minorities that it seek to make their lives better or whose lives it seek to make better. You also, I, you know, wasn't necessarily expecting this when the topic uh, was written and obviously things come out every topic author will tell you there are arguments made that they didn't fathom and uh i think defunding the police while i had seen it in some literature basis it became it propped up and it has come up as a, such a big topic now that everybody no matter who you are you need a defund good bad uh but you need that defund good bad both ways because i think that there are some arguments as to why defunding may work and why you know it may not necessarily be the best option you just need some reform, good, bad, you know, just reform, good, it works, blah, 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 that speaks for itself, but also some reform, bad, you can allude, you know, you can cross apply from what I said above, but also structurally, reform may not be the best way to weed out problematic cops, that instead of giving them implicit biases and trainings and that kind of thing, there may be ways to filter them out and make sure that they don't get hired anywhere else, and that may be a better model, and in that what is left, right? And so it may not be necessarily reform good, bad, but just approach the way in which we weed out the police. We can grant out that the prop that the policing is that the policing is problem. 
we can grant out that the policing is problematic, but the way in which you filter out or address that is problematic. I, E.g., you do it wrong. We think we should do this. Uh, and then you can get into your mechanism debates as well. Court efficacy, right? If they don't use the courts, that sets up uh, that, that sets up some places for your counterplan debates. Miranda and Brady are some good examples. Uh, executive reform, could it be lasting? Is it, is it not? And also legislative power. You know, the 94 Crime Bill, Fugitive Slave Act, those types of things. You know, your topic generics, I don't want to spend too much time here. Uh, we can all pretty much know what these are. And this is obviously not a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination, but there are just some things that I would like to highlight here. Uh, in terms of core clog, you know, that's a, that might actually be a good argument in terms of asset increased litigation and what that does in terms of the core systems uniquely now in the context of COVID and how a lot of court systems are going to uh, the online platforms. And so by overloading them, even in the online platforms, while that could create uh, ways in which they could be, you know, cyber attacks, da, 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 da. Those are some really good arguments that I don't think or impact scenarios that, you know, people may want to look at. Uh, the agenda politics uh, arguments here are good. You know, uh, even Republicans and Democrats, which, you know, I, people, it's, we'll get to this later. People ask me, what am I? I almost, I think at this point, we should start telling people I'm an Afro-pessimist. But I think that both Democrats and Republicans could, to some degree, agree that we need some type of criminal justice reform. But I think even the status quo proves how polarized or on what opposite sides they think that reform should look like. And so you can use those instances to highlight why the plan uniquely would be essentially like debated, hotly contested, your political capital scenarios are ripe for, uh, you know, excuse me, ripe for argumentation or exploration. And I think election politics is good here. I will caution you. I don't think necessarily the, uh, as and this is just my two cents as a black judge, my one person, but, you know, reading, you know, oh my God, CJR, black voters, I, I don't care what evidence you read. It's very, very difficult to convince me that as a black person, I'm going to vote for Trump because he did this. I think the better scenario might be the swing voters. And I think that calls into question the swing voters in terms of, uh, who are those swing voters? What percentage are the swing voters? Where are those swing voters? And that may matter in terms of battleground states or what are battleground states or purple states and things like that. So I think those are some good argument, you know, a good place to start there. Uh, the federalism debate. Oh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, oh my goodness. Excuse me, okay, federalism. You know, maybe this is a, a federal overreach in terms of what the federal government is doing. You know, white lash, you know, white backlash to reform. You know, people won't like it. And, you know, cops may quit and join alt-right groups, you know, full-fledged. And, you know, see what happens there. That's almost like, like a case turn or an impact turn to the app. It's a very great debate to have there. I think there's a good argument to make. A police union is just said, this is something that I thought about a day or two ago that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about. Uh, police unions have a very have have a, lo a lot of bargaining power, and there's a good argument to be made that uh, the concession of the AF in terms of police reform may lead to uh, other types of legislation or things that would uh, seed uh, more uh, that would seed more to like police unions, and that may be bad or roll back some of the AF. Also, uniquely, I think police unions are in a prime spot because. Uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle cater to them. And so the ways in which that will have like political ramifications, you know, you could read arguments about how they could affect Senate elections, uh, or you could just, instead of just as a whole disad, that could be an internal link scenario. Uh, so there are a lot of arguments to make about, uh, I want everybody to think about what role police unions play and how resistant they are to reforms and what happens when informs, reforms have been imposed on them in the past, because that is a part of, of the generic negative that I think we have under uh, research right now. And the court legitimacy arguments, you know, uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Roberts right now, uh, Chief Justice, is the new swing vote, you know, when um, that uh, he does a good job, uh, you know, and I, I'm, like I said earlier, I will consider myself an Afro-pessimist, but I think that Roberts does a good job of at least articulating, uh, not articulating, excuse me, of attempting to keep the court balanced to some degree. He always has a, a, a he, 
you know, he couples a liberal ruling and a conservative ruling. Even when he uh, joins the conservative ruling, he does a good job of assigning the uh, opinions uh, to uh, justices and has them written in a way that they're not overly conservative or narrowly textual or originalist. And so I think that that is a good place to kind of explore, right, that the AF, such a far, what would be interpreted as a liberal uh, reform, will force Roberts to then swing his pendulum to the right. And there are there are some ways in which he may, uh, you know, do that. You know, uh, abortion rights and access to abortion rights. There's always cases up, and with the uh, with the additions of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, I think that there are a lot of arguments about that. Uh, also, some uh, oh gosh, I had it and now I don't. The abortion rights case. Oh, political gerrymandering. Yes, and the impact that political gerrymandering will have. And depending on when the app is triggered, you can make an argument as to why that could affect the twenty the the outlook of twenty twenty. You know, even though the political maps may be drawn, and why that may help, uh, you know, get candidates in or change the sway, whatever, what, whatever have you. Uh, excuse me. All right, so we're gonna go to counterplans, and in the paper, and I think this is where uh, negatives can get some traction. There is that in the paper. Uh, the I talked about how process counterplans were important because if you look at a lot of the literature, specifically the law reviews that are out, there are a lot of arguments about why specific different types of mechanisms and ways in which to implement criminal justice reform and the steps we should take before that reform is uh, before we come to said reform, etc. Right, and and the impact that that would have. There's a lot of people that write about the literature and why in the past we haven't taken the time to think about that. Excuse me. We haven't taken the time to think about that. And so uh, that's just one thing to think about. Uh, agency piece, you know, uh, that's, you know, we I've alluded to that a lot. I don't want to spend a lot of time there. States, you know, the state's counter plan is good. Also with that, you know, you also have your state courts and stuff like that too. Uh, prosecutorial discretion. Excuse me, you know. The idea that, you know, maybe it's, even if we over-police people, maybe we should just stop giving prosecutors such discretion or maybe give them more discretion. You could cross-cut that counter plan. I think pick ground is ripe on this topic. I cannot stress this enough. Uh, I think that there are some really cool ways to be negative. And that's why I say, like, I would love to negate this as a two-in on this topic, is that there are some ways in which to read a very hyper-specific counter plan or pick unique to the app, right? Uh, the app does something uh, and you pick out of it. Or the specific mechanism of the app. Right? I'll give you an example, and this may not be a pick, but just to illustrate what I'm trying to get, the point I'm trying to make there. I could read a solvency deficit circumvention argument on case. It says the app will get circumvented, Barr doesn't hate it, he'll rail against it. That forcing it at the federal level, he'll just be like, nah, I ain't gonna do it. And then I can then read possibly like a state's counter plan or state court's counterplan. and says that that counterplan uniquely solves back the circumvention argument on case because it doesn't have to worry Barr. Barr doesn't have to implement it. Even if he attempts to rail against it, all of it is at the state level. And if you couple that with an argument that says most incarcerations are at the state level, so the AF won't solve the broader incarceration problem of the state, well then boom, you have a very good argument as a two and R to, to kick there the risk of the disab plus the lack of solvency on the app that the two solvency deficits, or if you want to spend them as a case terms or what have you, then you can counter plan solves those back, solve the, solves those back without the risk of the disab. Well, you're in a very good position there as negative. You know, it, it gives you the ability to make those arguments. What would be the net benefit in that uh, scenario? I don't know. You want to read elections because it won't affect the election. Boom. States don't link. Uh, do you want to read some agenda item? Boom, states don't link. Uh, if they're reading, you know, a, a court scenario, oh, well, then court legitimacy, states don't link. You know, whatever your net benefit is, you can make those arguments, you know. So there is a way to be negative without having to say all lives matter, blue lives matter. And there's a way to be negative without being problematic or racist or homophobic or transphobic. I cannot stress that enough. And so thinking about uniquely what you may want to pick out of and then reading offense about why what you are picking out of might be good or leads to certain types of things. I'll give you an example. Uh, the 1033F. Uh, okay, let's say 
over-militarization of police is bad. Sure. I'll give the AF eight minutes to make that argument. And then maybe I'll say, cool. Maybe in the 1NC, we'll read some arguments or evidence to suggest that uh, equipment garnered through the 1033 program has been used uniquely for two things. One, to combat domestic terrorism, i.e. Uh, mad white folks who think the world is out to get them. And number two, to combat uh, disaster, to be di prepared for disasters or for disaster preparedness. So a cool 2NR could be 1033 program might be good in these two instances, right? To fight right-wing extremism. If we win, that that might be good to fight that, then that is a unique case turn to the app. Boom. Don't do the app. Don't get rid of 1033 for that reason. Additionally, we may be able to make the argument that that also helps with disaster preparedness. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that equipment used in the 1033 program was helpful in like uh, Hurricane Sandy rescue missions. Uh, and even in the context of COVID, they have uh, some 1033 uh, equipment have helped, been helped for like triages and like medical places in certain areas. And so maybe you should limit the usage of SWAT and redefine what SWAT is. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that SWAT is overutilized. So if you more narrowly interpret the scope of what SWAT can be used and say that is a unique internal link to militarization, not 1033, that's a very compelling 2NR story and forces the 2AR to make very strategic and very, uh, you know, I don't, I'm just going to say it. They're going to be put in a bind. That is a compelling 2NR to say it's not the 1033 program. It's the overusage of SWAT counter plan will over narrowly define SWAT, limit out all the over stuff, the no knock raids, da 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 da. You get all the Breonna Taylor stuff. You can make those types of arguments. The counter plan would have solved back for that. Then you can say, we'll solve back for the uh, domestic racist, mad white people. We saw back that case turn. We saw back for disaster preparedness, read some COVID impact. Hurricane seasons are coming up. It's only a risk that they'll get bad or worse. We'll solve for that. Boom, limit SWAT. That gives us access to still use SWAT in these two instances, both in a disaster preparedness and also in the context of fighting local domestic terrorism. That is a compelling 2NR. I think, you know, if that is your jam and would be a very good debate, right? So think about that when you're thinking about being negative, that this is a place where you can kind of flex your muscles a little bit. Critiques, here we go, folks. You know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest, you know, you know, the, 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 existential question some would say the topic begs is reform versus abolition and i think that that is a very simplistic way of looking at it because to interpret the resolution in such uh narrow ways inherently excludes the afro pessimists in the room which wouldn't be a first by the debate community lol not loling like seriously like stop that but i do think that it does bring in larger questions which is why affirmatives that read abolition on the af it doesn't matter if you're negative. It does not matter if they read abolition on the app. You can articulate that your theory of power more and better describes the current world that they are critiquing and addresses the root problem or the root cause of the problem. And so uh, this is uh, probably where we're going to end up closing the uh, presentation is in the, cr the critical section. So if they're not reading abolition on the app, obviously you have abolition on the negative. You know, if they re-reform, the abolition critique is very competitive. The argument that uh, the app, and this is where the link debate, you know, for a long time, high school debate has refused to give, give us real tangible links in the 2NR. That is much easier this year. The argument can be made that any type of reform will be used as a way to not only justify the carceral state, but also will be weaponized in a way to then legitimize it and give it more power to then reinscribe that violence in more insidious ways that it gets not necessarily destroyed, but transferred into other parts of the carceral state, right? And then maybe just say abolition in and of itself is where we should start with the entire system, not, not just getting rid of the death penalty writ large, like abolishing the entire state, whatever, whatever, what have you. So I think there are some arguments to make that, there are some places to make that argument. Of uh, the set call teams, right? That even abolition in and of itself doesn't resolve the link debate on the set call, on set call. And I'm not real well versed in this literature, but I do think there are some arguments to suggest as to why even abolition would still not resolve the settler state and why start that is the wrong starting point. Uh, the anti-blackness teams, yes, I think that there are, there's a wealth of literature, uh, both in the context of CJR with respect to 
uh, anti-blackness, but also the way in which those two ideas intersect uh, with COVID uh, and the ways in which like prison releases uh, ha are or are not happening for certain individuals. But I also think that like for affirmatives that read abolition on the app, by far, and obviously I'm biased, by far the best answer to, to because to say that it is the carceral state is, that is the problem completely starts addressing what is the real problem too late in the game, right? And I think that is where if you are reading anti-Blackness arguments against these abolition apps, that is where you want to make your link debate, right? Is that to say it starts with the carceral state essentially agrees that it starts somewhere around, uh, you know, Reconstruction-ish, you know, or maybe earlier, but even then, what we understand as a carceral state was still a form of enslavement or black enslavement, that it still does not address the root cause that black folk went onto the ships as Africans, but came out as black. So it doesn't still resolve the overarching question that the existence of the carceral state, that the reason the carceral state exists is to police and incarcerate the black body. It's not a question of abolishing the state. Will it still appear? I think the anti-blackness or Afro-pessimist teams can argue that even in your act of abolition, the state will find a way to reinscribe itself to over-police or incarcerate or sentence black folk in some way, shape, or form, right? And then you get all your social death ontology or ontology arguments there. Uh, Necro, I think there are some really good arguments maybe against uh, reform or reform teams um, that I think uniquely the suicide bomber alternative could give you a lot of traction there. Uh, and I've only read it uh, a little bit, uh, and so I'm not going to say that I'm the best K person. I will tell you that uh, I think that no matter your theory of power, there needs to be a link debate, uh, an alternative debate, a reason why fiat is or is not, uh, a reason why fiat is illusory, and a reason why your alternative resolves the link debate. And I think that that is a compelling to an R no matter what theory of power you read. Uh, there are some arguments to make about uh, capitalism and uniquely about why, uh, uh, excuse me, it's not necessarily the carceral state, but the, the carceral state is in and of itself in a byproduct of uh, capitalism or whatever semio cap or whatever neolib or whatever, you know, you know, tangential theory you want to read there. I think that there are a lot of arguments to address as to why capitalism might be the root cause and what we need to do in terms of addressing it. Uh, black nihilism, uh, that as well. And the reason why I think it's important for us to uh, uh, make this distinction. A of all, anti-blackness, black nihilism are obviously two, distinctly, two distinct arguments. And I think that for a long time, myself as a judge, and I obviously, once again, will not speak for a lot of black judges, but I will myself say that it is, um, it is uh, unsettling, upsetting, and downright frustrating and irritating to be in a room where children are reading certain arguments and they look at black scholarship as a monolith or think that we all think the same, right? They think that uh, just because I'm a black person, I want to hear an anti-blackness round all the time. I love them, don't get me wrong. I love a good anti-blackness round. But at the same time, I love a good counter plan round. I love to hear a good politics scenario. Like I just want to hear a good debate, right? And so to, to, to think that these black judges will always want to hear these types of arguments or to not read the argument in front of us, i.e., I know some teams, if you look at their wikis in past years, will read certain arguments, will read anti-blackness or Afro-pessimist or black nihilist arguments when I'm not in the back of the room, but when myself or other black judges are in the back of the room, they don't read those arguments, right? That, that inability to be academically authentic about what you read and what matters to you, I think is important. And so I think on this year, more so than other years, it is important that no matter what you read, you think about exactly, am I making sure that I am not problematic in my theory of power? Do I read anti-Blackness? And do I read that argument for ballots and then reinscribe anti-Blackness in certain ways in the debate space or outside the debate space in my personal life? E.g., am I a non-Black person reading anti-blackness that will then turn around outside the round and make very problematic and racist remarks and refer to racist tropes or reference black judges as inferior or not pref black judges right like these are arguments and things that we have to think about and uh for and the last thing that i just want to say is you know for a long time you know we've accepted the idea that debate is a game debate is a game sure whatever but it's not basketball 
It's not football. It's not baseball. It's not track. It's not volleyball. It's not swimming. It's none of those. It is an intellectual game that in some way, shape, or form shapes our, shapes our subjectivity, whether you want it to or not. And the question is, does it shape my subjectivity and for the better or for the worse? And this is the year more than any other year that you can, even in the past, if you have, if debate has shaped your subjectivity for the worse, for the worse, this is the year where you can recapture that and redeem yourself and reshape your subjectivity in a way that you cannot be problematic. And that the arguments that you read, you can make arguments without sounding racist or homophobic or transphobic or sexist. Uh, and so I just want all of us to think about that. Uh, I look forward to a great year. I'm not the end all be all. These are my thoughts, right or wrong. Uh, if you don't like the topic, I don't care. If you like the topic, good. Uh, it, it, and the last thing that I want to say is, uh, I know that a lot of teams that are non-white, uh, that are non-gender uh, conforming, non, uh, yeah. I will say this, you may take some lumps this year. You may. People, you may have a judge that just doesn't like your argument, thinks your argument it, uh, talks too much about black people or talks too much about the over-criminalization of immigrants and they don't think that Hispanic people should be reading those arguments or they, you read an argument about how trans people are uniquely affected by the criminal justice system and that we always uh, accept them as invisible until they're hyper-visible when they're criminalized. And, other, and that may upset some people. And you know what I have to say? You may take some L's for that, and I apologize. And I thought about that. I, that, that has kept me up plenty of nights. But I want you to know something, that uh, every lump that you take will be for the better. Uh, if you take an L because a judge uh, is problematic or closed-minded, that is not a referendum on you. That is a referendum on them and their character. And so I just want everybody to be careful about the arguments that you make. There's a way to have very good, fruitful, educational debates without being racist and problematic. And with that, uh, thank you all. And uh, I look forward to a great year.